Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Live Lessons. I'm Steve Krenz. We are here in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Music City, and we're here once again in Groon Guitars. Gosh, just about the best guitar store uh, on the planet. And we're so excited to have with us Chris Rodriguez. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us. Um, if you haven't joined us before, a uh, couple of things as we get started. Go ahead and type in where you're from. It's always fun for me to see where everybody's from. I'm already seeing a couple of you doing that. Uh, Apache Junction, Arizona, Kansas City, Missouri, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, Minnesota. There they come. Uh, Long Island, New York, California. Anybody from overseas? Utah, Ontario. There you go. Nacogdoches, Texas, my home state, uh, Thibodeau, Louisiana, Pensacola, Brazil. Brazil, there we go, cool, all right, well, welcome everybody, uh, it's kind of a crazy thing, we get together on Tuesday nights and talk uh, all things guitar, um, if you haven't joined us uh, before, you need to be logged in in order to be a part of the giveaways, you need to be logged in at ustream.tv. Uh, just go ahead and log in there. There's a little bit of a login process, and then uh, your name will appear in the chat. You don't need to say anything, but your name will appear in the chat. And once um, we see that... Uh, let's see, an autographed CD by Phil Kagey and uh, uh, a cable, wonder, fantastic cable from Analysis Plus. So, but to get us started off with, Chris, can you, can you play us something? Sure. What are you going to play for us? Uh, I'm going to do uh, an old song uh, by the Spinners that I've always loved. And um, I'm going to try looping some things. I think the reason why I picked this song is it's only got two chords. There you go. So um, <laughs> um, here goes something. Hey, come on. Yeah. 
it out like a DJ. <laughs>
and I can get around on most everything right here. Now, if I want to take a solo, then I just go to my overdrives, and, and I have this uh, Strymon timeline for extra. Well, uh, talk us through your board here a little bit. This is this is one of your main boards that you use when you're out mm -hmm. uh, touring with everybody. Yeah, uh, uh, the guitar goes into this radial uh, switchbone, um, which I'm not switching anything now, uh, but essentially you can switch from one rig to another. Mm -hmm. So like when I was out with Kelly Clarkson, side one would be a clean rig that would go stereo out of the M13 to two clean amps. Mm -hmm. S if I click this, then it was a Marshall going through a boogie cab. Oh, okay. Just a Marshall. Super dry and loud, mm -hmm. Angus Young. Mm -hmm. Just about every chorus on the Kelly Clarkson tour had like crunchy guitars. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted a real, you know, I, w I kind of wanted to take out the wet, dry rigs yeah. where you've got the stereo thing mm -hmm. for imaging and mm -hmm. delays and things that needed to have imaging. And then, uh, boom, click that and you're, you're to the Marshall. But that's not engaged right now. So um, the uh, guitar hits this switchbone and then I go to my overdrives, uh, I'm sorry, to the wah, my overdrives, into the volume pedal and then out of the volume pedal into my time based stuff which is uh, the uh, Strymon timeline which and that's is a, a, just a delay just a, a encyclopedia of delays yeah. available to you um, there and then into the M13 which does everything from reverbs delays filters chorusing you know uh, that's the line 6 yeah. um, M13 stomp box modeler which yeah. has just about everything that Line 6 has ever done yeah. in one one unit. One unit, yeah. And um, I love it because it sounds great and it's real compact and um, it's it's got so many great features, the looper. Um, when I was out with Kelly, I had scenes, which are I think yeah, they're still in there, Mr. Know-It-All. <laughs> All I'd have to do is go press, press on Mr. Know-It-All and here come my four effects for that one song. Oh, okay. You know. You just channel Sometimes them they're not all on at the same, you know, it brings up the scene. I, I can, of course, turn them on and off if I don't need them all on at the same time. But, whoops, lost my ear. Um, we're back. And, um, but the great thing about that is I could set up scenes per song with custom tailor-built effects for that song. Wow. And. Um, Which you need when you're doing all the stuff on the road and you got to sound just like the. CD yeah, when you're and I don't. There's, you know, there's no break in the action between it, it, between songs. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's pretty much segues and going from once, you know, there there'll probably be like four songs in a row where think there's no break in the action. Then she'll talk to the crowd, you know. Mm -hmm. So I need I needed something that I could get from one song to the next with without having to do a lot of tap dancing. Yeah, because I'm doing a lot of tap dancing anyway. Uh, and that was uh, that was 2012 when you were out yeah, with Kelly Clarkson. 12, yeah. And so that was a pretty extensive tour, if I remember right. Yeah, was, I, you were I out was. For a while. I was subbing uh, for Corey Churko, who's a great guitarist. And uh, Corey's gig prior to Kelly was um, Shania Twain. Mm -hmm. So when Shania uh, announced her Las Vegas residency, he kind of got a leave of absence mm -hmm. from Kelly, and then they called me to sub. I just happened to sub for you know eight months. Mm -hmm. Well, it was yeah. a long time. And then last year I did four or five things with her. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you were with Keith Urban quite a bit last year. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't or been with that? Keith since 2009, but I, I was with Keith from 2004 to 2009. Yeah. So you've been on quite, quite a bit on the road. You yep. say that's probably half of your playing is on the road? On the road? Yeah, and, but I will say 2013 I stayed at home more than any other year. Yeah. Um, so there was enough going on yeah. just in town. But uh, last year I went out, uh, and and I'm going to go out still uh, with Peter Cetera. Mm -hmm. And I did some stuff with Amy Grant last year and Kelly Clarkson, and I'm missing something. Billy Carrington. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what's really weird about I, all those gigs, I was subbing. Just filling in. Filling in, yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it got to be kind of crazy because I, I keep charts, a book of charts on for every artist that I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're coming in from one gig and going to another and you you got to like it's like you got to clean out clean out your head and get the next gig in there. Yeah. Know? 
Now, you're originally from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. When did you move here to Nashville? Uh, well, we moved from New York to Miami. Mm -hmm. I spent my high school years there. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad got a job transfer down to Miami. And then uh, right in the middle of my senior year in Florida, he got a transfer up here. To Nashville? To Nashville. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up here in the late 70s. And then you went to Belmont? I went to George Peabody oh, okay. my very first year mm -hmm. and then transferred over to Belmont and finished. Uh, but I spent, yeah, I spent four years at Belmont. I yeah. was on the five-year college On the five-year plan. Yeah, I was on the five-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and what did you get your degree in, in guitar? Got my degree in, um, uh, I got a, B a BA in commercial music performance with a music business emphasis, yeah. But what a melting pot of players that come out, th well, through all the universities around here, but especially Belmont. So many players come through Belmont. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, when I went to school there, um, Dan Huff was there, Yeah. Gordon Kennedy, Gordon Kennedy, Gary Lunn. I mean, these are guys I see, you know, daily now, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's, we're still running around together, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was pretty amazing, actually. And I'm fairly sure I had never really stepped into a studio until I went to school there. Yeah. Because they had a studio. Mm -hmm. yeah. Had you always played guitar? Did you take lessons when you were younger, something like that? Always yeah. wanted to be a guitar player? Yeah, always wanted to, uh, you know, I would say by age six, seven, I was a complete Beatles freak, so mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to play guitar. I was already singing. Yeah. Um, but I started playing when I was 10. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would say it, the, I was very attached to the guitar. When we moved to Florida, uh, that's when the guitar never left my hands. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I moved down there and it was, this is the 70s and like there was a garage band on every corner you know <laughs> and um it's really like the movie almost famous where you know it's like you're right in the middle of this awesome magical period in your life right though you don't know it because it's happening to you but um yeah and i got in a band like the day we moved down there mm -hmm. so in new york i was just really hanging out at my best friend's house and listening to beatle records when i got to miami it was like band time yeah. And therefore, the guitar was just, st I was stuck to it, and it was stuck to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What guitar are you playing today? This is uh, a Les Paul Deluxe Gold Top that I got from Gibson when I first got the Keith Urban gig in 2004. And it's really dear to me, and it was in the flood. Well, I which was is just, why it looks. I was just saying, it looks like it's seen some, this thing seen some was, battle scars. This thing was underwater in the infamous 2010 flood. At Soundcheck. At Soundcheck. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as I've been told, uh, anything with like gold top fleck finishes, mm -hmm. that stuff got killed pretty early. This thing uh, swelled up to about here. I'm surprised it, because uh, there hasn't been many instruments that have come out from that that were submerged for that long yeah. and have sur survived and still playable. It swelled up and then uh, Joe Glazer said, put it in a uh, garbage bag with rice and come see me in about four months, which I did. And lo and behold, the swelling went down. Everything went back against the body, but the cracks, you know, the cracks were there, but they were flushed to the body. Mm -hmm. The next stayed true. So I asked Joe to just seal it. I said, I, I, I love the look. You know, this will always be a reminder to me that I got yeah. my guitar back. You yeah. know? Um, and those pickups, too, were completely Gosh, that's underwater. Just and, uh, you know, water dries. Mm -hmm. One of my M13s came back to life. Really? Yeah. It is, uh, I know so many folks, this was uh, 2010, 2000, 2010 mm -hmm. uh, when the big flood may. Coming up on the four year anniversary yeah. of it. Um, so many musicians uh, here in town lost the gear because it flooded Soundcheck, which is where everybody had stored their gear, all the touring mm -hmm. groups. I know Brad Paisley lost a lot of yeah. gear and a lot of just the average work a day musicians in town lost a lot of gear and amps and pedals and 
guitars and whatnot. Well, it's conveniently located 10 feet from the Cumberland River, and so it was like, it's funny because we've all been parking our gear there for 30 years, and yeah. it's just never really crossed anybody's mind, you know, yeah. that a 500-year flood would hit us. But um, yeah. I've, I fared fairly well compared to, you know. There's some that lost a lot. Uh, a lot of guys lost. A lot of guys lost. Big, big stuff, yeah. Um, as you have questions, uh, go ahead and type them into, our, into the chat. And then our producer, Garrett, will uh, put them up and so I can see them. Because if you have questions about specifically uh, anything that we're talking about, then we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I see one of them down here. I'm wondering what pedal board you're using and its size. Um, that's pedal train board, isn't it? Yeah, it's the pedal train pro. Uh, so the case that it comes in is actually bigger and it, there's like, it probably extends another six inches out this way. It's got like a little pouch for, mm -hmm. you know, maybe an extra pedal or some cables. And, mm -hmm. um, now, and it's it, on wheels. Now, what are you powering it with? Well, uh, it's, 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 all the power is routed right here. So mm -hmm. you just... And that's part of the pedal train, that larger pedal train board mm -hmm. that uh, he started to put in those now. Yeah. yeah. And um, I love it. It's, it's a fantastic... Um, and I've known John Chandler for a long time, the guy that came up with yep. these lifts here in town. Yep, I've got um, a pedal. My little board is a pedal train as well. They've yeah. got all kinds of various uh, sizes of them, down to their little nano one, which mm -hmm. I use for some of the, my acoustic stuff, which is really no much bigger than about 14 inches by you know five or six inches, big enough to put about three three pedals on, and that's about the, as small as they go. But then I've got this one, um, and I've got the hard case, which I use when I'm just doing in town stuff. And when I travel, I just put this stuff into a regular suitcase, foam it all up real good, and it doesn't attract attention to itself. Yeah. And um, it gets gets it around. But you're probably you're in a different thing with something that large. Yeah. This is like my in-town board for sessions, um, or it, you know, if I'm going to do a gig where uh, the 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 pedal board can go underneath the the, the bay of the bus. Yeah. But this particular one is too heavy and big to fly with. I have another board that's roughly got the same stuff on it, and it's about the same size, but it fits in a smaller case, and um, it's 49.5 pounds, so I can get through TSA. Um, had a question. Uh, Keith J200 is saying, how do you like your uh, full-tone OCD? That's an overdrive, right? That's yep. an overdrive. I love it. I love the OCD. Um, I don't love it for solos per se, but I like it for like a straight up, you know. Um, yeah, show us kind of what it sounds like. Yeah. Um. brighten it up I find that it's a really good pedal to give me like a cranked up Marshall sound yeah out of anything including and fenders and you know things that are not normally and you're playing through uh, just one of the amps we had here in the store which is the fender super reverb yeah which is 410 cabinet if I remember right I think in my heart of hearts I'm like a 6l6 tube guy mm -hmm. I probably gravitate toward the fender circuit just because it's I want the best clean sound that I can get. Yeah. Usually I can get, if I get a great clean sound, I can usually hit it with a pedal and get any kind of rock thing happening out of it. But I love the OCD for, um, for like a bass uh, tone. This uh, switchbone has a 5 dB gain. So if I want a solo, sometimes I don't even have to hit an extra overdrive on it. I can just... And that's, and that's that. pretty yeah. significant. 5 dB. It's, this, this box is awesome because when you slam another pedal with 5 dB, it's almost like having, it's almost like this is another overdrive. Yeah. You know, it's an, another gain stage. Um, I found myself hitting that boost quite a bit on the road. Um, the American Woman is uh, 
exactly what it sounds like. It, you get the... Uh, uh, Who's that by? It's uh, by Tech 21. And right now, I like that it's a fuzz. But you can get nice overdrive sounds, or you can get real, like, you know... Which is another song by the Guess Who, but not American <laughs> Woman. <laughs> yep. And then the Zen Drive, which many people say gives you the Dumble Overdrive tone so, in a yeah. box, you know. Yeah. Um, but I grew up on Larry Carlton, Robin Ford, all those guys. Yeah. Eric Johnson. Yeah. Um, and um, and I just saw Robin here last yeah, he week. Yeah, just here in Third and Lisley. When he doesn't have his dumbbells with him and he's mm -hmm. like on the road and rents super reverbs, he'll use that pedal to get him to get the characteristic overdrive that he's used to getting. Yeah. With a dumbbell. Um, so we had a had a question. Gretsch guy is asking. Um, Keith Urban is such an amazing guitarist. Uh, was it challenging to collaborate and get the guitars working together? Um, we hit it off pretty early. We had good chemistry right away. So I want to say it wasn't, we thought about it a lot, mm -hmm. you know. Of who would take what and who would take the, well, this part here, that part there. Yeah, and I, you know, I would try to use the guitar that would be apropos to whatever song we were doing mm -hmm. but if you know if i saw him on a telecaster mm -hmm. i'd play a les paul mm -hmm. if i saw him on a les paul i'd grab a strat i was always trying to grab a guitar that would not be yeah, stepping on frequency yeah. wise what he was on yeah and uh so it was good i mean we the parts were pretty well delineated so there wasn't a lot of guessing you know we mm -hmm. could but he was also kind of loosey goosey too. Like you didn't have to like, you could do the scripted part, but he kind of liked a little bit of, you know, just enough uh, question mark to the whole thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But uh, what about the Kelly Clarkson tour? Was that pretty well, same thing every night, laid out pretty solid? Yeah, with Kelly, um, and you know what, uh, with Keith too, we were. It was a controlled environment. We used in ears. Okay. Had click track, mm -hmm. um, because even though we had a full six, seven piece band, there would be. There were a few years where we didn't take keyboards out, oh, so okay. like a, a pad would come in on the bridge. Well, that would all be on the clock, mm -hmm. on. Um, um, Just a sequencer, somebody would yeah, be I mean, triggering that I, somewhere. I don't, I, I'm pretty sure we had Pro Tools out there, in terms of what was on the clock, but. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but Kelly was very, uh, everything was, everything was coming from Ableton Live from our keyboard player, mm -hmm. uh, who was the MD, Jason Halbert. Uh, so like click track, all that stuff was coming through. And uh, sometimes you'd need that, you'd need the click because mm -hmm. like uh, for, for sure with Keith, you would need it, especially if you were traveling some away from the stage, like there was a catwalk oh, on yeah. one tour where we'd be like leaving the main stage and walking down mm -hmm. and then you're you know you'd have you'd have sometimes I would leave one in ear out because I like the sound of it mm -hmm. but as soon as I got to the catwalk I'd have to put the in ear in because as soon as you start walking out you're hearing two the different yeah, times yeah. Yeah. things going up like at least 50 to 100 milliseconds with just a gigantic amount yeah. of delay yeah um, but Basically, uh, with both those artists, with Kelly and with Keith, it was like a studio environment, yeah. but live. Yeah. There'd be pre-recorded one, two, one, two, you know, mm -hmm. into the next song. And you'd want that stuff pretty screaming mm -hmm. because the crowd is screaming. Yeah, yeah. So you would need it in your ears yeah. at, a, at a pretty good level. Um, I enjoyed it. I always called it a studio environment in an arena any any sort of memories that you have of a particular tour or artist working with that it was just a guess you didn't know what you were going to come up to 
each night. It was it was a little bit more fluid, where you kind of knew the songs, but it was more like a a basketball game where things were going back and forth, and there was a lot of flexibility in the arrangements. I would say all my years with Kenny Loggins was very, um, you know, with Kenny there wasn't any click track. It was mm -hmm. five or six, maybe. A, oh, coming back. Um, when I first joined him, it was a big band, like eight, nine musicians, mm -hmm. a couple percussionists, but everything was live. Mm -hmm. So, and wedges, no ears. So, it's essentially, pretty loud, I would think. Yeah, and I find that you have to pay attention, maybe just ten percent more on mm -hmm. those kind of gigs because the click will give you at least a bit of a time crutch. Mm -hmm. You know, you're never gonna lose time. Mm -hmm. Um, but when there's eight or nine musicians and we're just looking at each other, it's, mm -hmm. it's real, it's, uh, you really, I find you had to be a little bit more on your toes in terms of like finding the groove and the beat and, yeah. and, and, and also the silences in between, like if there was a bar break and we hit and there's a bar break, well, you, everybody's got to come back up yeah. at the same time. So, um. The Kenny thing was a little more organic, a little more bre living and breathing. Mm -hmm. um, not any better, not any worse, just yeah. a different approach, yeah. you know. Um, all right, well, we'll let, uh, we'll let you rest here for a second while we do some um, uh, announcements. And one, uh, one thing, I see one more question here. Um, uh, Chris, see from your gear rundown that you have several Duesenberg guitars. Um, what do you like about them? You've worked with them for a couple of years. Now. Yeah. Um, I got to meet Nathan Foley, the president of Duesenberg USA, through Keith. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was Keith's Love, Pain, and the Whole Crazy Thing record where Keith was starting to use those guitars in the studio for the making of that record. And Nathan came into town, visited, and brought him guitars. And they said, um, I wasn't in the studio recording. And they said, man, you got to meet Chris. And we became great fast friends right away um well i love duesenberg guitars i mean they just they're unlike anything i've ever played mm -hmm. the scale the feel of them um that real you know su superb construction that you would expect yeah. from you know german products yeah, yeah. it's kind of like that mercedes aesthetic yeah. to a guitar yeah um they've got that beautiful bigsby-esque Gretchy feel to them, you know. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like somewhere, you know, of a cross between like a what a Les Paul would feel like and uh, maybe like a Gretsch Duo Jet, you know. Yeah. And they're real loud and zingy and very present. And um, I love using those guitars, especially when it's kind of more of a like an Americana kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the Chris Isaac, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th they're far more useful than just that, but uh, yeah. I'm just thinking of a particular yeah. application that I like. Um, fantastic. Well, we'll let you catch your breath here for a second, um, and then you'll play us another tune here in a, sure. here in a second? Sure. Um, all right. Well, we've covered quite a, quite a gamut already of things. Let me, uh, let's give away something. We've talked enough. Let's give away something. Um, this is a... Regular old Groon's shirt from right here at Groon Guitars. Beautiful, large shirt. Um, let's see, the winner of this is G Cobbler. Greg, which I can pretty much tell you who that is. Greg, uh, you have just won this uh, thing. Greg, send us your uh, information at uh, service at stevekrenz.com. Um, address and, and stuff, and I'll, we'll get that mailed out to you. Um, it's always fun. Always fun to do that. Um, wanted to let you all know of um, several resources we've got going on. Um, we finished up last month's uh, resources with all the great Phil Kagi resources, and you guys really took advantage of those and uh, bought me out of all those. We had to reorder all that stuff, so I apologize that it took us a week or so to get some of those resources out. But, man, they were great, weren't they? Those two great songbooks. Uh, of Phil Kagi's and then the uh, autographed uh, Win in the Wheat CD. So I hope you guys are enjoying 
the Wind in the Wheat remaster CD. That was one of the CDs that uh, got me into fingerstyle guitar playing and kind of expanded my mind a little bit was that uh, CD of Phil's way back when. I don't know, it was like 1984 yeah. or 81, something like Early, that. Yeah. And uh, I remember listening to that and listening to it over and over and over again. How is he getting those sounds? How is he making those runs and all that sort of stuff? Anyway, it's fun fun passing on that uh, information to you guys through the songbooks and through the CDs. So hopefully all that stuff has gotten to you, gotten to you by now. Um, so thank you for being patient. We've got a new sale up this week um, for, the, for the rest of this month on some blues resources. So that, I believe, is the furthest leftmost button underneath the Ustream window that you're watching right now. Uh, some blues resources. I picked three of the best ones I could find. We had um, uh, 100 Blues Lessons um, book, but it has uh, everything written out in it in music notation and tab. That's in there. And then a DVD, almost four hours worth of content of um, different 200 blues licks. And they explain them. They do it in slow, and then they do them in fast uh, or regular speed for it. Uh, everything's notated on the screen. It was great. Uh, resource and then the third thing, kind of our triple threat of our blues learning resources was from uh, co our good friends at Coffee Break Grooves. Chris Cutler out in Los Angeles makes these tracks for us, and uh, um, it's his first two blues projects. So it is I don't know probably 30 different tracks, and uh, or maybe not that much, probably about 20 tracks. But each track is 15 minutes long, gives you a good. Uh, chance to work out soloing ideas and scale ideas and things you're trying to work out. Lots of different styles, different keys. Check it all out. Three great resources, and we got them on sale for $69.99, and that'll be going through the end of the month. So we don't have too much longer on it, about another uh, two weeks on that sale. So if you're interested, take advantage of that, and all the proceeds for that go to help support all this craziness. So um, we appreciate it. Um, let's give away one more thing. Speaking of Phil Kagey and autographed CDs. Um, when I was getting the CDs for the, the, the last bit of ones that we were selling uh, for last month, this was a couple of weeks ago, I uh, met Phil for breakfast, and he was excited to... Um, this is his latest CD. Uh, there's actually a trilogy. There's three of these with the, excuse me, with the guys from Glass Harp, uh, his original group. And so this is the one that features the drummer, but it's really the, all three of them uh, are on there. And absolutely, I've been listening to this in my car for the last couple of days. Fantastic playing. And Phil autographed this as well. Someone is about to win this new project from Phil Kagey. The winner of this is uh, Kia Joy. Kia Joy. K-I-A-J-O-Y. Uh, you have just won autographed Phil Kagey CD. Fantastic. Um, uh, send us your information at service at uh, stevekrenz.com. Mailing address, uh, phone number, screen name, things like that, and we can uh, we can get you fixed up from there. Cool. Um, Got a couple of crazy. Uh, a couple of questions. more questions here uh, before you uh, play another one for us. Chris, Gear Rundown says you have a Vox AC15, great amp. Uh, since this is only 15 watt amp, uh, what do you use it for? Well, I like that amp. Um, it saturates very very easily because of the low wattage so sometimes I'll use it for like um, some Brit rock stuff you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. it, it never gets uh, super saturated but it's it's a beautiful sound um, also if I run it through a more efficient cabinet than the cabinet that comes with it it's a fantastic clean amp uh, the AC 15 is just I've got the hand wired AC 15 yeah. uh, which is a beautiful amp mm -hmm. and uh, it's got the uh, special pen toad uh, so you can engage the EF86 tube, which is sort of the, the magic of that circuit. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use it for a lot of different things, but, but the thing I love most about it is just to crank it up since it's low wattage and get some of that just crunch organic crunch. Yeah. yeah. Um, D2 Racing, um, Sylvan is asking, Chris, can you talk about your 65 amp Soho amp? Yeah, and I would say of... I've I've amassed a good deal of amps now, but that <laughs> amp is uh, probably in my top three that I own. Mm -hmm. Just for uh, it's essentially an AC30, but with a bit more. Uh, it's an EL84 circuit, so it kind of gives you that classic, you know, Beatles to Queen, you mm -hmm. know, 
any, all those bands that are associated with AC30s, it gets there. But it has a couple of marshally flavors, mm -hmm. a couple of bump switches that are on there. It's actually called the bump switch mm -hmm. that if you engage, um, it really, uh, it really gives you a, a few more colors than just what a EL84 circuit would give you. Now, have you messed around with the Kemper profiling amp at all? I, I have not, uh, but all my friends have one, and I'm exceedingly jealous. <laughs> I've heard several, several of the guys just rave about it and well, say that's the future. Yeah, uh, I uh, played a, a showcase last week in a band uh, backing up an artist, and my fellow guitar player played through a Kemper, mm -hmm. came out of the Kemper into... Uh, a power amp into a cab, so oh, he okay. still so had still had the sound. Yeah, but the but the house was getting the direct signal, so the cab was just there for his head on stage. Oh, okay. Just so he could feel a little bit more, because mm -hmm. we were on wedges, not on ears, mm -hmm. and um, it sounded fantastic. <laughs> um, he he let me list, He let me play through his rig with phones, where I could really hear all the stereo stuff mm -hmm. that was going on, and I was blown away. Wow. I thought it was amazing. Got to have one. Mm -hmm. Waiting for a relationship with the good, good <laughs> folks at Kemper. <laughs> good folks at Kemper. Yeah. Um, can you play us another one? What, what, sure. What, can you, what are you going to play for us? Uh, I'm going to play something off my record that came out way long ago that is out mm. of print, and I'm sorry I didn't bring a copy. No. But they're no, hard to fine. find. Um. <laughs>
Thank you. Beautiful. What's the name of that? Uh, it's called Your Love, and it was on a, a record of mine that I did at on Word Records um, called Beggar's Paradise. Beggar's Paradise. Yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, all right. As we're kind of coming into the home stretch here, we have a couple of questions that were um, sent in on our discussion board, so I wanted to make sure and get to those. Um, lost in the 60s tonight, Rich from Winchester, Virginia, is asking, uh, how did uh, you get your start and what influenced you to play guitar? We kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, how did you get your start? What was your first big gig playing guitar? First gig on a national level was with Michael W. Smith. Mm -hmm. And um, I have Dan Huff to thank for that because mm -hmm. he was at a some Christmas event, Dan's father is a great uh, a conductor and arranger and composer. And uh, it, was, it was a Christmas show, and, and they were hanging out, and he said, man, I need a guitar player for a tour. And he said, well, you should call Chris. Mm -hmm. That was back in 85. Mm -hmm. And so that, I would say that was the thing that kind of got me out of, you know, just playing clubs mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, on the bus and you know, t 50 city tour. Yeah. Um, that was the big thing. But I mean, the thing that motivated me to just become a musician was the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, as a child, it was all I thought about, you know, and I have John and Paul to thank for singing and <laughs> Michael Jackson and Marvin Gaye, you know, the, the, those four people. Yes. Kind of really, turn me on what has been some of your most memorable times out on the road or in the studio with an artist doesn't have to be even a big one sometimes even just the smaller club things is some of the most memorable things yeah um a big one real big one was in 94 i played a, an event at the hollywood bowl with kenny loggins called earth day mm-hmm and Kenny played, Don Henley played, 10,000 Maniacs, Jackson Brown. And the closing act was Paul McCartney. Really? Who an extended an invitation to anybody who had performed that day to get up on stage during Hey Jude. Uh, so I was on stage with him while we're singing Hey Jude during the na, 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 mm -hmm. na. And most of the song, he had been in the middle mic on acoustic guitar, but when it got to the na-na-na-na-na part, he came over to the acoustic piano, which just happened to be where I was parked. And he gets, he like puts a leg up on top of the piano, you know, <laughs> while he's like, I don't even know, he was standing on the stool, one leg on the piano and reaching down and playing chords. And he's got his arm up like this and uh, a friend of Kenny's had a press pass and was out taking photos. And a month later, he goes, I got something for you. And he hands me an 8 by 11 And there I am under McCartney's <laughs> arm. So that's just like unforgettable. Yeah. I mean, that's just like childhood dreams, you know. Yeah. That was, a, that was humongous. Yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Um, do you remember your first professional recording session? I do. It was um, the first thing I ever got paid for was Rich Mullins, yeah, his first record. Mm -hmm. And um, though that was a vocal session, the first guitar session I did was a jingle in town. The Rich Mullen thing went great. The jingle, not so much. <laughs> I was extremely green and it was trial by fire. Yeah. I got mostly burned. Yeah. 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 But um, it was great because it kind of motiv motivated me to just get it together for the next time. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, let's see. We've already, the other one, LMG, Guitar Nut, you were asking about Keith Urban, so we've pretty much answered that one um, already. Um, I know you have a relationship with Analysis Plus mm -hmm. with their their cables. Um, how did you how did you get in contact with them, or how did how did y'all cross paths? Because I know you're one of their artists. Well, uh, a girl uh, down in San Antonio who does a lot of their um, artist rep stuff reached out to me. Just uh, 
I, th- I was with Keith at the time, and uh, they make just these uh, amazing cables that are oxygen free and super high end, and I I love them. I love them. They're amazing. NASA is wired in this stuff. <laughs> Whatever their analog stuff is, is wired in this. So, um, uh, I had I knew that Chris was one of uh, Analysis Plus's artists, so I emailed uh, Mark, their uh, president, and uh, he graciously um, provided a cable for us to give away. So, actually, he provided two. We're going to give away one now, and then we'll give away another one in a, in a future broadcast. But someone is about to win. This is he's given away. Um, I don't actually have the one that he's given away. It's on its way to us. But it's just like this. It's a dark chocolate uh, cable. Fabian, I believe, our moderator. Fabian, you've got the the link that I have for you on that. Um, um, and I think he's given a, he's given away a ten foot. This looks like it's probably a twenty foot. That's a twenty, yeah. Yeah. Um, great cables, gold tips on the end. I think the ten ten foot cable retails for. $89 or something like that. Someone is about to win that. The winner of the Analysis Plus cable, fantastic cable, is Hawk441. Uh, Hawk441, um, man, congratulations. You got one of the world's best cables. Yeah. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, check out Analysis Plus. Uh, Fabian, you've got the link to us. Hawk, you need to send me your information at service at stevekrenz.com and uh, al- mailing address, screen name, a uh, phone number if you can, and uh, we'll go from we'll go from there. Um, do you ever get nervous as you're working with these big things and doing these huge things? Or do you get nervous with that sort of thing? I don't get nervous when I'm a side man, but uh, put me at the Bluebird in front of a hundred people that it came or are, are going to be listening to one of my songs, yeah. and then I'm a basket case of nerves. <laughs> But if if I'm just on the you know if I'm not on the middle mic, mm-hmm. I seldom have nerves. Mm-hmm. I got just enough, maybe slight jitters mm-hmm. that it's good. Yeah, kind of can the adrenaline kicks up and it's it's mm-hmm. it's good. Has that ever been anything that you've wrestled with? Nerves, mm-hmm. not so much. But. I would say that's primarily because I find myself in musical situations that are not, I don't want to say they're comfortable for me, but they're in, more in my comfort zone yeah, yeah. than not. Yeah. You know, yeah. if somebody stuck me in, in a band and said, all right, you got to start playing like Brad Paisley right now, mm-hmm. I would start ha- having crazy nerves. <laughs> yeah. Cause, um, what is some, just as you're thinking back of, how you've learned to play and, and um, all the opportunities that you've been given. What is some, what's like a word of advice that you remember getting that you thought that has really paid off and stuck with you throughout the years um, for guitar playing and stuff? Anything come to mind? Well, I was just doing a session a couple months ago with a really great guitar player in town, and we had the same conversation. He was turning me on to this concept called effortless mastery. Oh, yeah. We recommend that book. That's one of the books that we have, have talked about in the past, Effortless well, Mastery. It's so funny. When I was growing up in New York, my dad, um, who's no longer with us, he kind of taught me some of those basic concepts way back when. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't called Effortless Mastery. So that mm-hmm. all those concepts were familiar to me. But just the idea of like that you play your best stuff when you're not even really thinking about it. Yeah. When you've got so much vocabulary and so many tricks up your sleeve mm-hmm. that you can just sort of grab it all mm-hmm. and and then you stop thinking about playing and mm-hmm. you're just in this zone mm-hmm. where the great stuff happens, mm-hmm. like what I like to call unconscious basketball, yeah. where you're just out there and you're just nothing but net, you know? Yeah. And um, I'm I'm working toward that because... I find myself, you know, the more I grunt and practice through something that I'm like, the best stuff happens is when you're completely relaxed and you're just really light on your feet. So Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to recommend to people that the the greatest thing that you can do is to build up your vocabulary and then relax and have fun with it. Yeah. 
And yeah. um, I always feel like the best singing happens that way and the best playing. Right. And uh, where I'm not like, oh, what scale do I use here? I, I, I think about that stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. But I try not to think about it when I'm on the bandstand. Yeah. I try to I, I try to go through all the rigmarole of all that when I'm at home working on stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, what do you What do you Do you still working Are you still working regularly on your technique? All the time. And what What type of things do you do? Uh, YouTube is my greatest teacher. Mm -hmm. um, Scott Henderson is a great guitar player. Yeah. You know. He was, he, I, I saw something yesterday, if I can just. Please. Yeah. Um, he was saying, take a B minor chord. Everybody knows, you know, the blue shape. Hmm. Now he goes, take that same pentatonic shape and move it up two frets against the same chord. So you're not doing anything different, but... Twists it a different way, doesn't it? And you can also play the A pentatonic. You know, he's like, all right, now try skipping strings. Uh, can you hit that B oh, okay, minor? Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, and, and think of all the. So just going through the pattern. Yeah, yeah. That kind of a, yeah. That kind of a thing. Any any usage of any of those notes in the uh, B minor position, mm -hmm. which is basically a a D pentatonic. Mm -hmm. You can play the E pentatonic or the A pentatonic because basically those notes They're all for B minor come from the A scale. Mm -hmm. you, like you can also play an A major scale over this. That's all an A scale, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm always looking for the uh, uh, cool shortcuts. Yeah, yeah. You know, things that motivate you to make music quicker. Yeah. You know, and so that was something I discovered yesterday at Morning Coffee. I was like, <laughs> okay, what do I want to learn today? Well, I love Scott Henderson. He's got good things. Mm -hmm. And that was, that. I, I was like, wow, YouTube, the secrets of the pentatonic scale. I'm like, I'll hit that. Mm -hmm. Pentatonics are, you know, mm -hmm. that's our bread and butter, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. But it's interesting that the color, and then is is kind of more of a jazzy, yeah, yeah, yeah. slightly outside color, yeah, yeah. you know. And I did nothing but move my my hands, yeah. you know. So mm. little tricks like that are 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 cool. Like I'm gonna use it. Our band is playing uh, this weekend, and we do a Steely Dan song called Black Friday. up with my looper ah because I'm not in looper I can I can use it on that song yeah. you know It's 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 basically a, a over a one chord vamp. How to how to come up with interesting you know uh, places to go over that one chord. Right. You know. Right. Instead of just staying in the instead of just staying in the box, mm -hmm. which is great too. I love that. You mm -hmm. know, that's that's the essence of rock and roll playing. Is we're, what key are we in B? Right here. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris, for being, you, Steve. being here. You got one more song for us? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm going to go to the acoustic. Good. Great. Uh, while uh, Chris is getting um, um, settled in here, gosh, I turn around and you guys have more questions for me. Chris, can you describe the chord progression 
used for the arpeggios at the end of each verse in the original song that you were just doing. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm going C major. I'm keeping, and I'm just moving the bass around. But you're... And I'm playing C that, sharp major, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm tuned down a half step, so I should let you all know that. That, mm -hmm. that is what looks to be a C sharp, but I'm actually a C. But I'm going to call it a C sharp for our purposes. Mm -hmm. That's a C sharp chord. And then I put the uh, fifth in the bass. Then I move it to the sixth. And then to the, to the uh, major seven. step and then uh that's a four chord f sharp and then i made it minor, minor by yeah. by uh bringing the bass note down so i'm kind of creating the chordal mo i'm changing the chord by moving the low notes Basically, that's what's going on there. I've been playing these so long, I don't even know how to actually analyze them for you. And that'll you take me back to the tonic. Um, D. Howenstein is asking as we we're uh, wrapping up here, Chris, what kind of music do you sit and listen to? Do you like to listen to? Are you probably listening to lots of different styles? I listen to a lot of different stuff. Honestly, to open my ears up, I listen to tons of jazz. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I love old blues. It's got to be really, you know, for, uh, really sophisticated or really primitive. <laughs> yeah. But um, I love all the Miles Davis, Gil Evans recordings. Yeah. All the, uh, so that would be the uh, Miles Ahead, uh, Porgy and Bess, and Sketches of Spain. Yeah. All three of those are like, they're kind of like Sergeant Pepper to me. You yeah. know, like Sergeant Pepper is loom, looms large. Yeah. But on, on, on that side of, of the musical scale, they feel as important yeah. for my ears. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we have covered the gamut here. A um, couple of announcements, and then Chris will play us out with one more uh, song. Um, our next live lesson will be April uh, 1st, next Tuesday. Uh, need to make an announcement, though, on that. We had uh, had Florida Georgia Line um, booked to be with us, um, but that has since, unfortunately, fallen through. Um, very sad about that. I got a phone call about that yesterday. So, unfortunately, Florida Georgia Line will not be with us uh, next week, uh, but we will do, uh, or let's see, next week we're going to have a Blues Open Talk, and April 1st, which is when Florida Georgia Line was going to be, uh, I'm not quite sure what we'll have there. We'll... I'll figure something out. But next week, we're going to be uh, back at Visual Sound um, Studios down in Spring Hill. And uh, we'll be having just an open talk, and we'll be talking about blues stuff as well. Try and show you guys some blues uh, concepts as well. Um, we have some new uh, lessons up on Gibson Skills House, uh, where we provide um, the educational content over at Gibson.com. Um, I've got a lesson up there, a 30-minute practice routine. And then we also have a foundation lesson on uh, fingerstyle guitar. And then one of our great 10-minute power workouts on finger flexibility. Have all kinds of different exercises in there. One of them from Phil Kagey. Man, if you can keep up with the Phil Kagey finger flexibility exercise, you've survived. You've graduated. Um, we have one of our artist interviews with Rick Vito from Fleetwood Mac. Do you know Rick? I, I've never met Rick. You've but never I met him? I know who he is. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. a tremendous kind man. Yeah. Um, Fabulous slide player. He's been with us several times. Great. He's been one of our favorites. We need to have Rick, Rick back. Um, he's over there in one of our artist interviews in Gibson.com. Got a new song over there uh, that they have put up. Actually, not a new song, but Mama Told Me Not to Come by a Three Dog Night. Uh, uh, one of the instructors, I think Brandon, has put that up over there. Um, if you like the live lessons, please like us underneath that video. There should be a like button. 
Uh, that helps Ustream to recognize what we are doing here. And uh, let us know. Check out uh, Groon. If ever you're here in Nashville, come check out uh, Groon's. Um, you could, they've got their website, groon.com. You've got your website, chrisrodriguezmusician.com. Yeah. And uh, so all of Chris's information is there. If you want to learn more about what Chris is doing, um, that's a great place to start. If you want Chris to play in your project, it's on that as well. So I'm also on the Facebook. <laughs> so uh, all kinds of different ways you can keep up with us. Um, if ever you're in Nashville, come, come to here to Groon's and uh, check out this amazing store, which they still have right over there. Nobody's bought it yet. I'm surprised you guys haven't bought it yet, is the, uh, the first Fender Strat. So I noticed it was on the... Have you heard about this? For a cool 250K. For a cool 250K, that could be yours. That could be your new guitar. Um, so anyway, lots of fun. Got to see the great things that they have here at Gruen's. Um, I want to thank George Gruen and uh, Greg Voros, our kind host for this. Uh, thank you, Chris, very much for thank being here for with us. Me. What a blast thank having you here with us. Uh, thanks to all, the, all of our technical crew that make this happen. Garrett Hessler, uh, Austin Lord. Um, thank you, all you guys. Fabian, our completely unpaid moderator. Thank you, Fabian, uh, Daniel, for keeping up with all of this sort of stuff. Um, I think that's about all the things. Oh, no, I forgot a big one. Um, Acoustic Guitar Magazine, their Player's Choice Awards are going on this month. Um, you, the, it's the center button underneath your Ustream window. If you haven't voted yet for the Acoustic Guitar Magazine's Player's Choice Awards, check them out. Um, go there, and uh, in, they, have, they broke their form up into three uh, or four segments. We're in the third one, Accessories and Instruction. And uh, last time they did this, which was three years ago, um, the guitar course that I did with uh, Gibson um, won for Best Instructional Material. It's quite amazing. Amazing. And uh, we beat out Hal Leonard and Mel Bay and all these wonderful folks. It was one of the highlights of my life, uh, seeing that that came up. So it's up again this year. So if you're um, interested, uh, make your vote count at the Acoustic Guitar Magazine's Player's Choice Awards. Uh, we're in the instruction uh, category, which I think it's like there's three questions in there. We're like the third, or we're the second question. Uh, for instructional materials, go down, choose Legacy Learning Systems, which is who put out the course, uh, and then you can write in. They have a little section where you can write in, and you can write in and learn to master guitar. And also, I just thought for fun, we're not even listed you know, for the online resources, but if you want to go down to the online resources one, go down to Other. And then when it has you in the model where it says you can write in stuff, type in live lessons. If you enjoy what we do here um, on a weekly basis, just type in live lessons with Steve Grenz, and we'll see what happens. See if we can maybe uh, get recognized for the work that we do with live lessons. So it's a lot of fun. So uh, ballots close down on March 31st is the last uh, day for that. So it's kind of, a, kind of a cool thing. It is very exciting for us, and we can do the write-in campaign for live lessons. That's always going to be fun, too. All right, that's enough of me jabbering on. Um, what are you going to play for us? Uh, I'm going to do a song from my record. Uh, this one is called This Time Around, mm -hmm. and it was the first single. I went to any length I gave it all my strength but I couldn't hold it together, no These are bitter winds that blow Yet I'm learning to be still I'm gonna let it go And rest in your will Trusting in you this time around All of these dreams come true I poured myself into Like a ship into the ocean 
now I bring this empty cup that I wait for you to fill. I'm gonna lift it up and rest in your will this time around. I'll be in a cross or a crown. Lift me up or kiss me down. I'm trusting in. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Keep up the hard work on your learning. It's worth it. Making music is a great thing. We'll see you next time.